Hi everyone, my name is Mr Barlow and welcome to episode 13 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 2, Area of Study 1, and I'll be talking about adaptations and how they help a species survive in the environment that they live. Now, Area of Study 1 in Unit 2 is basically about the various adaptations that species have made that that make them so well suited to the environments in which they live. Now, all environments consist of both abiotic and biotic factors. So abiotic factors are the non-living parts of the environment. For example, rocks, the temperature, wind, water, uh, pH. And biotic factors are living things in the environment. For example, all the plants, the trees, all the animals that an organism might eat, uh, the bacteria, all the living things. Now, different organisms obviously require different things to survive. And if one thing an organism requires to survive is found in a limited supply in a particular environment, then that thing is called a limiting factor to the organism's survival. And this will affect the distribution of where the organism lives. So, for example, humans require oxygen to survive. But oxygen is found in a limited amount in water. So, because humans can't get enough oxygen out of water, it means they're limited to being terrestrial organisms or living on land. So the distribution of humans is only terrestrial. They can't live in uh, water because there's not enough oxygen and that limiting factor limits their survival. Now, adaptations are basically characteristics of an organism that have been favored by natural selection. So they're things that have evolved over many generations. They don't just happen all of a sudden or appear all of a sudden. Now, a great example of an adaptation is a giraffe's neck. So years and years and years ago, a giraffe didn't just grow a long neck. It didn't just happen bang like that. What would have happened is there would have been a whole bunch of you know, giraffe's ancestors. Some of them would have had short necks and some of them would have had long necks. And then let's say there was a drought and there wasn't as much food around. Only the giraffes with long necks would have been able to eat all the plant material high up in the trees. So those long necked giraffes would have had enough food and they would have lived, but the giraffes with short necks would have died. So then the giraffes with long necks had more kids. And let's say the drought continued or over generations and generations. What would have happened is only the giraffes with long necks would survive during each generation. And those giraffes would be the only ones which ended up having babies. And of course, um, the offspring of an organism look very similar, have similar characteristics to their parents. So eventually, over many, many generations, only the longest neck giraffe kept, kept reproducing. And eventually, you know, all giraffes had very long necks. Um, and it was basically something they adapted to. So they were better able to survive in their environment because they were able to eat a a bigger range of food from the top of the trees and the bottom of trees. So this great survival advantage that a long neck gives giraffes um, makes it a great example of an adaptation. Now there are actually three main types of adaptations. There are structural adaptations, physiological adaptations or behavioral adaptations. So a good example of a structural adaptation would be the long neck of a giraffe. So a structural adaptation is basically any structure that an organism has. A structural adaptation of humans would be the fact that we've got teeth and our teeth enable us to mechanically digest food. Or we've got a really big brain and that um, enables us to um, outthink basically every other species on the planet. Now an example of a physiological adaptation in humans would be that um, we convert nitrogenous wastes into uh, urea and then we excrete that urea. So the physiological excretion of nitrogen is one of our adaptations. And a behavioral adaptation uh, in humans is, is a good example, is that humans care for their young quite a lot. So because we care 
for our young quite a lot. It means our young have a greater chance of survival. That means the species have, has a greater chance of survival. So, you know, the behavior of caring for our young is a great adaptation. So, yeah, there's three um, types of adaptations. There's structural, physiological, and behavioral adaptations. Now, we can have a look at some of the adaptations that organisms have made to enable them to better survive in their environment in which they live. So, for example, we can look at organisms which live in water first. So, water can have a variety of abiotic factors. The water can have a different pH, so it could be more acidic or more basic. It could be a different temperature. Uh, so, the ocean is a good example. Temperature of the water at the surface of the ocean is hotter than the temperature of the water lower down in the ocean. And you can actually get different amounts of light in water. So there's more light at the top of the water than there is at the bottom of the water or you know, down near the sand. Now, if we look at the example of a plant that grows in or on water, plants that um, can live in water are called, or live in, where there's lots of water, are called hydrophytes. So for example, a water lily has its roots in the water because um, it sits on the surface of the water. And that's really handy because plants need to get lots of water. But a plant also needs to get gases. So it needs to get carbon dioxide in for photosynthesis. So what does it do to get uh, gases? An adaptation that the water lily has made is that it has stomata on the surface of its leaves, not on the underside of its leaves like most plants. So stomata are the, these little holes in the leaves of plants, um, which is where gas goes into or out of a plant. So that's an adaptation that water lilies have made to enable them to survive more effectively in their environment. Now another good place to look at the adaptations that organisms have made is on the seashore. So the reason that this is a good place is that this is a pretty harsh place to survive. So you can actually split the seashore into three main zones. There's the, there's the subtidal zone, and that's the area below the average low tide. So it's pretty much always submerged underneath underwater. Then there's the intertidal zone, and that's the area between the low tide mark and the high tide mark. So sometimes it's covered in water and sometimes it's not. So you've got to have some pretty serious adaptations to survive there. And then there's, then there's the spray zone. And that's the area just above the average high tide mark. So it doesn't get much water, but it's a pretty, uh, pretty salty, harsh place to live too. So an organism that uh, survives in the subtidal zone is kelp. And kelp has got you know, quite a few good uh, adaptations to help it survive. It's got these holdfasts which keep it held onto rocks so it doesn't uh, wash away because you know the, the subtitle subtitle zone's really um, rough with all the waves. It's also got these fronds which are photosynthetic but they float up to the surface basically so they can get more sunlight up near the, you know, near the top of the ocean and that helps them survive. In the intertidal zone, you have to be really tough to survive there. So for example, a barnacle, uh, that grabs onto rocks. So when the tide goes out and there's just air, they suck onto rocks. So they create this suction thing uh, and they do that so they don't dry out in the air. But then when the tide comes in, they release the suction a bit um, and they move off the rock a little bit and all the nutrients flow around them and um, you know, then they see that's when they eat and that helps them to survive. Another good example um, of a really great adaptation in you know, water environments is one that mangroves have. So mangroves have these things called pneumatophores and pneumatophores are roots, but they're roots which go up to the surface instead of down. And the purpose of pneumatophores is basically so that um, mangroves can get carbon dioxide. So the reason they need to do that is because right near you know, the seashore, there's actually not much gas in the soil because there's so much water in the soil. So they put up these roots, these aerial roots called pneumatophores, and that's how they get gas into the plant, how they get carbon dioxide into the plant so that they can photosynthesize. <laughs> Now obviously animals that live on land have adaptations too. 
So for example, reptiles that live in the desert have good behavioral adaptations to regulate their body temperature. So for example, if their body temperature is cold, they'll go out into the, into the sun to heat it up. But then if they get too warm in the sun, they'll go under a rock or into their burrow so that their body temperature doesn't get too hot. So that's a good behavioral adaptation that reptiles have, some lizards have. Now speaking of deserts, plants which grow in hot, dry environments are called xerophytes and they obviously show some adaptations too. So for example, a structural adaptation of a xerophyte is that they've got less stomata than normal plants. So that means they don't lose as much water vapor um, out of them as a normal plant would because it's, you know, it's really hot in the desert. So normally lots of water would evaporate and be lost through uh, stomata if they had lots of them. They've also, their leaves have also got a reduced surface area. So um, that's a stru another structural adaptation. So basically a lower surface area means that a plant can lose less water through its leaves. Plants uh, which live in really salty environments called halophytes have some physiological adaptations to enable them to survive in their environment. So for example, they can excrete excess salt from salt glands, um, some of those plants. So yeah, that's a physiological adaptation. Now some other interesting adaptations are the ones that Australian plants have uh, to survive bushfires. So there's a few of these. For example, some Australian plants have got a really thick bark and the bark acts as insulation, which um, protects the vulnerable inside bits of the plants. And it protect, protects what's called the cambium layer, which is the part of a plant which produces regenerative growth. So the bark actually also um, protects the epicormic buds of the plant. And these buds allow sprouting and regrowth of the plant. So basically that thick bark um, enables the plant to regenerate and regrow <clears throat> after a bushfire has gone through and killed all its external foliage. It'll still be able to, you know, regrow and regenerate. Another example of an adaptation in some plants in Australia is uh, something called lignotubers. So these are these swellings, uh, underground or subterranean buds, and they basically enable the plant to uh, regenerate again when the aerial parts of the plant have, you know, die or have been burnt away. So, you know, if a fire goes through and kills all the um, plants that are above ground, a lignotuber underground will enable regeneration of the plant um, and enable the plant to survive. And some plants, for example, uh, wattle trees, produce seeds that really interestingly only crack open when it's really hot. So these plants basically take advantage of a bushfire, killing all the other plants. So a bushfire goes through an area, kills all the other plants, and only then do their seeds crack open. And then the seeds get into the ground and germinate and grow a new tree, but they grow when there's no other plants growing. So that's a really interesting um, adaptation that enables them to you know, take over um, an area. So that brings our discussion of adaptations and episode 13 of the VCE Biology podcast to a close. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thanks for listening.